So welcome everyone, it's good to see you. So um, today's topic is the end of problems, the end of all problems. This is something absolutely everyone desires. We all desire the end of problems. Nobody wants to experience them, yet we all do experience them on a daily basis. If you look at the way you are living your life, then you see it is based on exactly this. It is finding solutions to problems that exist, that are either coming from outside or that are self-created. And so mostly we are just busy trying to fix things, make things better, improve things, get out of a uncomfortable, unpleasant situation towards a more comfortable and pleasant situation. When you sit down and you take actually time for yourself and if it's just 15 minutes and really look at yourself with all honesty, without uh, escaping, running away, without distracting yourself in some way, then you will see this tendency very, very clearly. There's no escaping it. You'll see that we're busy literally every second experiencing some sort of discomfort or trying to get out of it in some way by either moving our body or moving the mind in some way. So this is constant. And it is not something that you need to believe in, that's not dependent on religion or whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter. We're all experiencing the same type of thing. The body and the mind constantly creating some sort of problematic state that you then need to solve. This is life. Probably the best way to illustrate life is just your simply the, the seated posture you're in right now. It gets uncomfortable. When it peaks, when the discomfort peaks, you change. Change your posture. And then it gets uncomfortable again, and then you change your posture again. And it gets uncomfortable again, and then you change your posture again, etc., etc. I could go on for the whole hour. And life is just exactly like this. I'd like you to not just listen to this and kind of hear it as a piece of information, like when you read a book or watch a YouTube movie or whatever, but really let that sink in. It's going on right now as you listen to this. You're confronted with difficulties every second, and they grow in intensity every second that you stay still in your posture. And then it, you need to change. And that's the body. But the mind is the same and your emotional being is the same also. Emotions also don't do what they are quote unquote supposed to do. What are emotions supposed to do? They're supposed to make you happy and spacious and relaxed. They're supposed to be beneficial and warm and kind and good and holy and whatnot. But they're not. Instead, they are entities that simply change. It's a process. There is an emotional process. Emotions are not fixed things like consumer goods. You can go into a supermarket and pick your emotion and just take it. And then you have that for the rest of your life. But emotions are a process. It's a circular process. There is emotions there that are in their in their vibratory states pleasant, you can say, that are desirable. And then there are emotions which are in their state rather unpleasant. But they are not two things. They're not two objects. This is, as I just said, one process. The pleasant emotion turns into the unpleasant one. And the unpleasant one turns back into the pleasant one. And this just goes on non-stop. Some people, they can slow down this process. 
a little bit. If you live a life that is relatively skillful, then you will experience less of the unpleasant, more of the pleasant emotional state. But still, it doesn't last. And still, it's subject to change. And still, it is conditioned. When I say conditioned, I mean it is dependent on many factors, not just your will. That would be great. You could just will your emotions into a, a whatever pleasant state. And I want to feel good, so I just feel good. So it's just like kind of dependent on the decision I make. Is that true? Is it dependent on a decision? Are your emotions listening to the decisions that you make? How about your thoughts? How about your body? Does that follow your decisions? Like if you decide your body to be healthy, does that body just agree and turn into a healthy body? Of course not. You might be tired. You can't just wish your body to be more awake. Instead, to be more awake has a very specific cause. For example, rest, sleep, take a nap, eat. You know, there's many things that could make you tired. So you find out the cause of something and you generate the cause, the result follows suit. So it's a world in which we live that is based on cause and result. That's a very simple law. It's just like gravity. You have the law of cause and result. If you do something, there's a result to your action. And not just one result, but many. It's kind of a chain of results. But similarly, your action itself is a result too. It's a result of a previous cause. Actually, cause and result, these two words are synonymous. Whatever is a cause is necessarily a result. Whatever is a result is necessarily a cause. Wherever there is a result, there necessarily is a cause. Wherever there is a cause, there necessarily is a result. Synonyms. So if you perceive something as a cause, then you also look at a result as well. Understanding just that much, you might navigate life in a way that's a bit more skillful. You can create the causes for happiness, and you can abandon the causes that lead to suffering. For example, you can have thoughts of gratitude, very simple way, to create a bit more happiness. You can cultivate appreciation, appreciating your own skills, appreciating your own um, goodness, appreciating the goodness around you, the goodness of other people, which is a cause for you being more happy, isn't it? You can also do the opposite. You can also criticize other people. You can look down upon them. You, you can see them as an inferior person that is possible too, what will that cause? It will cause your own misery just that much. And probably misery for some others around you too by that. Because the, the cause is miserable, the result is miserable too. They are in accordance. So we have some limited kind of control here. We can create certain cause. That's what we can do. You cannot prevent life from happening, though. You cannot prevent uh, your body from becoming painful. That's just the natural fact of the body. It's a painful thing. But you can decide how you deal with it. That is possible, thereby creating a better cause. You can either complain about your body being painful. That is an option. It's probably not a really constructive option, but it still is an option nonetheless. Or you can um, learn to relax your body from the inside. You can learn to deal with pain. You can receive your pain with kindness. You can relax and soften around your pain. 
thereby learning a new skill set, actually, which is quite useful, which helps you to relax the next time you're experiencing problems. That's quite nice. But what is a very thorough path to the end of problems? And what does it actually mean, the end of problems? Let's assume you would all experience the end of problems. What would happen to your life? How would it look like? Now you have experienced the end of problems. So now when you leave this room, will your life be flawless? Will everything work just as planned? Will people leave you alone? Will they only praise you the whole day long and never blame you? Will you only be successful no matter what you do and never unsuccessful? Will you never get ill again and always be healthy? Will you never die and always stay alive? Will your complexion all of a sudden be like super radiant and amazing? What will happen if you experience the end of problems? What will happen to life, to circumstances? Well, nothing. They'll just stay as they've always been, changing things. Just the only thing that changes is that you're not making problems out of circumstances anymore. That has stopped. And how is that possible? How is such a thing possible? Well, we need to learn to abide in presence. As simple as that. One of the most difficult things for people, I think, is to really be present. To really do what you do 100%. Meaning, you take a shower in the morning, you're really there. You feel the water. You relax under the shower. You're, you're fully aware that right now I'm taking a shower. I'm right here. I'm alive. I breathe. My heart beats. I'm right here. Your mind doesn't go elsewhere. That's the end of problems right there. In that moment, you're not experiencing any quote-unquote problem. What you're experiencing, in fact, is feeling, sound, smell maybe. The smell of your shampoo maybe. You feel it as you rub it into your hands. And you're right there with it. But how many of you actually do that? How many of you are actually taking a shower? Or eat breakfast? Or walk to your car? From the door of your house to the car? How many of you actually walk? It's a few steps. And it's not much to ask. You see, but most of us, we have problems in our head as we walk to the car. We go through problems that are in our head, thinking about our problematic lives. If you wouldn't do that, problems wouldn't exist for you. Then there would just be the left leg steps, the right leg steps. That is not problematic at all. That's all. It's just feeling. It's just sensation, just the body walking. And it's actually quite a miracle to have this body that walks. It's a weird thing. There's bones in it, there's blood in it, muscles. And we kind of take it like for granted, like I'm just walking to the car, what's special about that? But you're walking to the car. That's quite a special thing, actually. It's just one tiny nerve, if that's severed. For you, there is no more walking to the car. And it's a tiny fiber in your body, just some... Just a nerve. And if that's severed, there is no more walking. Walking, you're done with walking. Now it's sitting rolling to the car.
that as such is also no problem rolling to the car that's fine unless you're thinking I wish I were, was walking then it's a problem again so we're all experiencing various circumstances various things in our life various states state of illness of good health success and failure blame and praise we're all experiencing that it doesn't matter how enlightened you are you're going to experience these kind of things so the most powerful masters I know they are subject to criticism heavily so it's not that when you're suddenly enlightened everyone stops criticizing you the, the Buddha himself was subject to criticism people wanted to kill him people wanted to get rid of him Jesus similar story he was actually killed So it's not that everything's suddenly going to be fine when you're enlightened. Life is just life. Just for you, it's not problematic anymore. You're just here. And if you're truly present, if you're really present, if you're having a refined present moment where you really hear how a sound unfolds right now, how many birds there are around actually, how the aircon vibrates, and how you actually can feel the sound of the aircon inside of your bones and how your heart beats and how your lungs expand and contract if you're aware of that in that moment you are here without problem there is no problem you are not a problem you are a present your presence, you're aware, awake, open. And if you can maintain that state, the more you can maintain that state throughout your day, the less problematic your life becomes. It's a pathway to the end of problems. It's kind of a choice that we need to make. The choice between just burdening ourselves with an infinite amount of thoughts that will never lead to a solution ever that will just lead to more thoughts or coming into an inner space where thoughts lose their value and you lose your interest in them and here is the difficulty for most people we really value thoughts a lot there's something inside of us that wants to think that says as soon as your thoughts are threatened it says yeah but how can we live our lives without thinking about anything that's not possible I wouldn't be able to make any decisions anymore I couldn't go shopping anymore I wouldn't know what to buy I have to think no you don't I always do give this example what, what am I holding up do you know what this is do you have to continuously say in your mind remote control, remote control, remote control, remote control so you're not forgetting what it is? Or do you know it even without saying the words in your head remote control? Do you know what it is? And what you can do with it? You know, right? You don't have to say the words in your head. Similarly, you know who you are. You don't have to constantly say your own name in your head so you're not forgetting yourself correct Vanessa 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 as soon as you get up in the morning you go Vanessa 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 until the end of the day when you fall asleep you go, ah that's the end of Vanessa the end of that particular problem <laughs> you know who you are you don't have to say your name all the time like Pokemon right they have to say their name all the time you know things you know a car you don't have to say car 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 in your head now what would happen if just that much would fall away in your life the commentary in your head 
would you still be able, even though your head is not forming sentences, would you still be able to do what you're doing? Would you still be able to take a shower, even though there is no voice in your head talking? Would you still function? Of course you would. Of course you would. In fact, many times you have moments in your life where your head is not talking. You have it right now, as you're listening to me talking. If you're listening to me talking, your own head is quite empty. There's not much going on. That is nice. That's why people enjoy listening to talks or watching movies or YouTube clips. Gets them into a state below thought. You read a book, you listen to a teacher, whatever. You engage in a conversation, we like that. It's nice, it's a bit of rest. The moment that you listen to someone, you have no problem. The moment you watch a movie, you forget about your problems. That's why we enjoy this stuff. You read a book, no problem. You go to sleep, no problem. Why? Because you're not thinking about your problems. And if you put a person for 15 minutes only into a room without distraction, it's unbearable for them. There's a scientific experiment that has been done precisely with that. The people perceive the 15 minutes being alone with themselves and awake in a room without distraction as unbearable. There's nothing to do and we don't know what to do with ourselves. Then it's 15 minutes of problems. There's one living problem trapped in a room for 15 minutes without solution. Just having to face all this never-ending trash coming up. Now, maybe in your case it's not trash that comes up in your mind, but mine certainly is. I'm watching my mind most of the time and it's just endless bullshit endless. It's a chain of bullshit that just doesn't stop. And the funniest thing is it sells itself as being super important. I must think about this now. It's so important. And it's not. Not at all. And only gradually through practice and through suffering do you learn to drop this stuff. It's not important. And so you start to trust something else more. We're not trusting the voice in our heads anymore, but we're trusting that which is listening to it more. So the listening quality, the seeing quality, knowing quality, becomes more important than what is known, than the stuff that floats by. So we're cultivating actively awareness, the knowing quality, seeing directly into whatever arises in the space of your consciousness, in the space of your mind. Thinking, feeling, hearing, seeing, thinking again. Seeing it for what it is. And as you really see it for what it is, you lose your interest in it. It's like Sasha mentioned last time, mindful smoking seems to be like a new sort of program uh, where people who want to stop smoke they do mindful smoking they smoke really mindfully they really know what they're doing every little step of it they know they bring to their mind what they are inhaling as they inhale they really pay attention and it seems to help to be confronted with our own delusion makes you lose interest in it. The Buddha calls it dispassion or renunciation. You become dispassionate about it. You lose your interest in it. Oh, it's just thinking. Not important. Not my business. Nothing to do there. And you let your thoughts pass and their power becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. That is the path to the end of problem.
imagine one day where you would just be present. In the morning, you stand up, you feel the tiles underneath your feet as you walk to the bathroom. You feel the doormat in front of the bathroom. And entering the bathroom, the tiles, you feel the tiles again. You come, you sit down on the loo. You feel the urine leaving your body. You take a shower. You feel the water. You brush your teeth. You taste. You feel the brush in your mouth. Etc., etc., until the evening, until you close your eyes again like that you would still go to the office you would still do your work just no more talk in your head this is very possible and it is something that we should all cultivate if we desire happiness because this is at the cause of happiness it's at the root of it what, what is at the root of suffering and one of the most draining energies in our life is this constant chain of thoughts in our head and our devotion to it, our we're like worshipping thought. Most of the conflicts you see online, all of the conflicts you see online, they're nothing but thought constructs, fabricated ideas that we fight about and bicker about and ruin our days for nothing. For nothing. It's empty. If you truly see thought, if you truly see into thought, why will you be dispassionate? Not because you're kind of telling yourself, oh, these are just thoughts, but you see so deeply into them, you see they're empty, there's nothing there. Thoughts are empty. Neurons firing in your head. Nothing there. I'm not telling you to be convinced that thoughts are empty or to believe what I say. I'm telling you to look. Look into your own thoughts. Take the time. If you're really interested in happiness, if you really want to be happy, then that's what it takes. It takes to understand yourself and to really see what's going on. Life, directly. Understanding things directly with a valid cognition. That's the path to the end of problems. Presence. Start right there. Do what you do, 100%. Be fully there, unite body and mind, wherever you are. And this now is practice. So, obviously I can't do that for you, and I can't motivate yourself only you can now motivate yourself to keep going and look at yourself with honesty and see what's really going on inside of yourself and then choosing what's best for you. Okay, so that's all that comes to mind for today. Are there any questions?